that we're not from an entrepreneurial background at all. Mm. And so the fact that we've both ended up in this area, I think it, it is quite unusual in mm. some ways. There was always something that was, what if? Mm. Um, or what, I think it's that, what if it doesn't work? And I've always had the approach of why wouldn't it work? That's my probably my one piece of advice to sort of husband and wives. You, you do have to have the backup plan. You have to decide, right, if it's not working out, which one of you is going to go back into a permanent job, or you start it with one of you, you build it to a certain point before the other one joins. But we've lost the business. <laughs> yeah. was it, the, it was as bad right. as that. So when the pandemic started, we basically lost 90% of our income overnight. 2020 was brutal, absolute. I mean, if you're yeah, you're selling office furniture to people that aren't in offices, that's a you know, I challenge any sales. <laughs> but we've always looked at it as you might not share our surname, but it ultimately it's a it is a family business. I think team team fit, team culture, and, and nurturing that mm. is a huge part of of, of our yeah. success. I believe everyone has a story to tell. Through seeking true, authentic insights about the entrepreneurial journey, I provide a platform for our peers to share their stories and inspire those that listen. This is the County Business Talks podcast, produced by H2 Productions. Okay, welcome to another episode of the County Business Talks podcast. Today I'm joined by a husband and wife team that founded the award-winning ergonomic furniture company Posture People. A friendly team of ergonomic geeks. Posture People are an office furniture consultancy specialising in display screen equipment assessments and ergonomic products. They've helped over three and a half thousand plus companies and individuals to improve their environments. They are experts in their field and have appeared on the BBC and been quoted in national publications including The Guardian and Evening Standard. I'm delighted to welcome Joe and Dave Blood to the podcast. How are you doing guys? Good, thank you. It's lovely to be here. Awesome. Very awesome. well, Sam. Nice to see you. Lovely. Look, we're going to jump straight in, okay? Start, tell your story. Um, tell us a little bit about life growing up for you both. Something about your early years that has shaped who you are today. Go for it. Oh, gosh, how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> so I probably had a very traditional background, if you like. Um, I grew up in a place called Potter's Bar, which is uh, North Hertfordshire, yeah. or North London, sort of bottom of Hertfordshire, and went to school, didn't do particularly well at school, sort of scraped my A-levels, and then ended up going to study business at Liverpool John Moores University, and I just, again, didn't know what I really wanted to do. My dad had been a bank manager, and so I thought, well, I'll go and do business, and I, I just really enjoyed it, and then thought, well, that's what I want to do after it really just go into big businesses and that was very much how I saw my career going is staying within the big business world but so. not to, so doing business at, at you know wasn't didn't come out of that thinking I'll do it I'll run my own business no, no never never I was a corporate girl through yeah. and through I liked big companies I liked the structure I liked the training liked the career progression never thought about running my own company in a million years wow and Dave? Um, polar opposite of that. <laughs> um, obviously a good, solid Essex boy. Um, that. Managed to meet a girl from, from Hertfordshire. Married up. <laughs> Traded up. Um, <laughs> um, similar at school. Um, yeah, got through my GCSEs um, as they were at the time. Um, left school, 16. Um, engineering apprenticeship. Um, four years of that. Tried to get into sales in engineering and was kind of turned down there because I didn't have a degree in engineering. Um, and from there went on a very convoluted sales career involving property, uh, recruitment, um, and then eventually found furniture in the late 90s. Um, but working for somebody else at that mm. point, not currently working for myself. Yeah. So, But same with you, like no aspirations to run your own business was ever that, that no that not not uh, not from the get-go no um no it was it was it was it was very much something that i i fell yeah. i fell into um having set the company up with a with a previous employer yeah. but yeah not a wasn't left school 
entrepreneur that's it that's the way forward no but fun enough both our dads are bank managers so actually they have quite a low risk approach so yeah. i don't that, that we're not from an entrepreneurial background at all yeah. and so the fact that we've both ended up in this area i think it, it is quite unusual in yeah. some ways so and what would what, what, what did your parents think about that then when you do start i'm gonna run my own company and what, what? i think well i think my dad was a secret entrepreneur in some ways he always liked the idea of business mm. and i think my dad was exactly the same yeah there was always something that was what if yeah. um, or what i think it's that what if it doesn't work and i've always had the approach of why wouldn't it work mm. so I don't, i've never worried about the what if it doesn't yeah. uh, a lot of people have said that you know that's why we work so well together is we've got that balance yeah, of, yeah, yeah. of course it's going to be fine versus we better just put something in place in case it's not fine <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but yeah both dads i think maybe would have if they could have yeah if not, they could have chosen a different path if they could have worked for themselves with the security of being yes. a bank manager <laughs> yeah. then they'd have both yeah. done it and then so would everybody yeah. i suppose yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but what, what was your like at school then what was your dream what did, did you have like Joe, you mentioned you didn't know what you, I was similar. I didn't have a clue yeah. what I was going to do if I didn't play football. Then, well, that was it. Didn't uh, didn't know. But what about you? Did you have fully, a... fully focused, or all the way through school, fully, fully focused on architect? Really? Always going to, always going to be an architect until uh, I think probably at the beginning of the fifth year of seniors. As I know it's not called that anymore. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Whatever it was, it is to me, mate. Yeah. So we're yeah. all right. We're yeah. on the same year place. eleven or something. <laughs> at the beginning of that, I did a little bit of research to find out that it was kind of like a four-year degree and then three more years of potential training and and I'd had it with school at that point so I ended up doing the engineering apprenticeship Shit. where I did a day release to college and, and that sort of thing but it yeah. was if you'd have asked me nine through to 15 it was always architect wow um, okay. Yeah, I like the idea of it. And now I get to work with architects. Yeah. So I suppose in a roundabout kind of way, I'm, I'm sort of doing it. But yeah. yeah, very, very, very focused until the critical point where I binned it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you had until to I, do some work. Yeah. <laughs> until I find out how much what, work Seven years? Was. No, no, yeah. I'm, I'm out, I'm out. Yeah. yeah. Actually, into what I love about, well, actually listening to that about the, the, the what if thing and the, because it is, as a business owner, you've got to, it's got to be that element of going, it, be, it will be alright. It will be alright. And also, actually, looking at it and going, because amount of people go, oh, what's, what, what if it doesn't? And what if this goes wrong? And what if that goes wrong? But actually, if you go, what if it goes right? And how great that could be. And I think that I, I interviewed Panina Shepherd. I don't know if you know Panina yeah, from, yeah, from, yeah. from Acumen. And she, her thing was always, she said, like, you know, what's the worst that can happen? But she said, what I actually say is, what is the best that can happen? And once you put your your mind frame in that sense you go actually yeah where could that go and what, what could that develop to and here we are how many years later still running a business and going what has happened and yeah. where you've gone to which is which is amazing well, look t Dave tell me oh, about, obviously you worked in um, obviously the ergonomic furniture industry for for f about four years or so and then and then you went to look back into recruitment is that right for so, yeah no so i i worked for an ergonomic furniture supplier in london oh, yeah. for four and a half years yeah, yeah, yeah. as an account manager there right, right. then we moved we moved to brighton right, from right, right. there okay. um and i needed a job so i went to the place that had actually placed joe in a job um and two hours later I came out with a job at the recruitment company <laughs> <laughs> that was supposed to be placing me in a job. Um, came home, Joe went, how did you get on? Are oh, they going to send out your CV? I went, no, no, no I've got a job. That's, that's <laughs> fine. I'm a recruitment consultant. I start Monday. Um, wow. And, um, <laughs> yeah, it, was, it, it wasn't, it was recruitment wasn't for me. Uh, it wasn't, it was, it was, I mean, it was great. People I met, office environment, all that kind of stuff. Got a lot of very good friends in Brighton from, from that, but didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy the role at all. Right. Um, and then after a couple of years of that, had the brainchild to go back to my old MD and suggest that we opened a Brighton branch of the London company. So right. that's how the company started. Um, we were originally called the Backstore Brighton because right. we were the Brighton branch of the Backstore trading out of Hammersmith. And then in, that was in 2002. Yeah. And then in 2005, me and Joe bought them out of the Brighton operation and Posture People was born in... 2005 
Um, but yeah, that was yeah, it was it wasn't getting, but it was almost getting back into furniture sure. as opposed to getting back into recruitment. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. That was a part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair play. And, then, and Joe, you obviously, because uh, you, your your background was in obviously motor trading and telecom. Right? Yeah, and then. <laughs> So then how do I get into furniture? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Obviously, you've had a little bit of a background. Yeah, yeah. You've obviously seen the vision for it, but then your role to go, oh, I'm going to come in. Yeah. And how does that come on? So I'd always worked in a kind of HR stroke marketing role, stroke account management. So sort of ops, admin, sorting out that side of thing. Um, and when I, when Dave bought the business so I'd sort of always been interested and in sort of helping him a bit behind the scenes mm. but effectively I was working for a marketing company at the time as an account director and then actually got pregnant so it was our first child we decided to start buy the business but Dave was going to run the business and I was going to go back to the marketing um, firm so that I'd have the stable income while he built the business up except the marketing company then said actually we need to make some redundancies would you like to go for voluntary redundancy and the more I thought about it the more I thought, well, it gives me sort of about six months worth of money um, so that I could actually do a couple of days with Dave working. We could see what it was like working together. Mm. And then if I hated working with him after six months, I'd go out and get myself another job. And so that was 17, 18 years ago. <laughs> and I haven't killed him yet. <laughs> so... <laughs> As in, again, back to that point of, look, I talk on here, a lot of people and will ask often, oh, when's the right time to start a business and when's the yeah. right time to get involved? And you, like you, you allude to there, I guess, about, you know, you had your sort of first child. And that is not that, the right no, time to do it, by right the way. No. I'm not sure I would ever advise. I actually think there was a hormonal imbalance going on <laughs> because that is the, probably the most riskiest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. And I would never normally have done that. Not at all. So, but but actually, when you look at like you know, the, again back to the whole what if things and that stuff. Is there ever a right no. time? Same with same no. with starting a family. Yeah. With, with yeah. You go, yeah. Oh, is everything going to be aligned? And all, yeah. And yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Now I've got that in place yeah. and that in place. Actually, yeah. There's no. Yeah great time to start a business because no, you right. always same with buying a property you go oh, I'll wait yeah. till the just until it starts mm. it's going to come down soon and I'll wait for that and it keeps going up and go, actually mm. just get in yeah. if you're if you're in that frame of mind you go actually let's just go and give it a go what, and you actually you, you know when you've got a family as well you go oh, I'm forced to make it work yes and we were it, and I suppose I had I always need a backup plan mm. so I had the backup plan in my head that after six months effectively if we hadn't got to a certain level of income I would go out and I would get another job somewhere mm. and have a sort of more corporate job again mm. um, and I suppose we did have the benefit of Dave doing it for a couple of years beforehand so we knew yeah. the business was going to bring in a certain amount of income mm. so effectively I could plan to say right we know this is what's coming in mm. if we do it and try and give it a real push can we grow it enough that it supports the two of us but I, that's my probably my one piece of advice to sort of husband and wives. You, you do have to have the backup plan. Mm -hmm. You have to decide right if it's not working out, which one of you is going to go back into a permanent job, mm -hmm. or you start it with one of you. You build it to a certain point before the other one joins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, probably that's where I balance the risk. Some people would be like, right, all in. Yeah, but yeah. it also gave us time to see whether we could work together as well. So yeah, because that for, for obvious reasons, you know. Uh, and we'll go on to it a little bit later, I'm sure, about sort of work, the work-life balance sort of scenario as well. And actually working when it is both, like, for example, I work, Kelly doesn't, you know, she knows about the business but not involved in the business at all. So I could go home and I won't necessarily talk about the business, whereas... I guess uh, we talk uh, a lot about the uh, business. That's what I mean. Like, but, but I always think it's strange for people who don't work with their partner. It's like, what do they talk about? Yeah. Do you run out of stuff? Whereas we've always got it's like endless yeah. amounts of things to talk about. So I've never had a problem. In no, that's true. Anything to talk about. <laughs> 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 it's really, it's, Joe's told me we are on the time. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you should have just got me in for your twenty-four hour yeah. podcast. Yeah. I could have just done the whole. Mate, thing. I'm going for the world. But Forty hours. You're yeah. on the list, mate. I'm telling you, you're, you're coming in. You're coming in. But look, well, talk to me then about obviously always 
running a business is challenging. There's always challenging times and stuff like that. So over sort of the 18 years of doing that, what talk to me about some of those challenges. I guess especially with being in the industry you're in, mm. supplying office spaces. Mm. Talk to me, I guess, I guess, about March 2020, what happens then? What goes through your mindset when you go, oh, we supply office furniture and then actually... All the offices are coming yeah. up. What, what, what goes through your mind at that stage? That we've lost the business. <laughs> was it? The, the, it is, was as bad yeah. as that. So when the pandemic started, we basically lost ninety percent of our income overnight. And so for the first three months of the pandemic, it, it was we like looked. At, it was like a light switch. Everything went off. And so Dave and I looked at each other, and we were like what do we do we, we funny enough we have had a very tough time before in 2010 mm. so the business was at the point of bankruptcy in 2010 we we're at the tail end of the recession again lots of people weren't buying I was pregnant with my second child <laughs> or our wow. second child sorry and we, we'd kept a salesperson on too long that actually wasn't bringing anything into the business mm. um, and so I think because we'd lived through that very very tough time before we'd always had a po policy of having six months money in the bank mm -hmm. and so when we came to this time round we knew we were okay for a certain period of time and we knew that gave us enough time to make some very tough decisions as mm -hmm. well um, for, for us, the furlough scheme was amazing. So it meant that we could protect everyone's jobs. And so we very quickly put everybody on to furlough. Um, but that meant Dave and I, as directors, couldn't benefit from the scheme. So yeah. we've never worked so hard in our life, yeah, to be completely yeah, for honest, less for less money. <laughs> and yeah, it was really tough. At one point, I think both our parents were like helping us pay <coughs> food bills and things like that. Yeah. But then slowly, things started to come back and actually it allowed us to rethink about how we did certain parts of the business as well yeah. um, it allowed us to make some very tough decisions a couple of member staffs were made redundant but with the furlough scheme it allowed us to give them three to four months notice so although we've gone through the whole redundancy period mm -hmm. and process we actually said right well this won't trigger until the end of furlough comes through and so it allowed them to find jobs as well it mm -hmm. gave them a long period of time to be able to do it um, so it, it was really, really tough, but it exposed quite a big weakness in the fact that our e-commerce business wasn't as strong as it should be. Mm. Because if we'd have had a really strong e-commerce business, uh, everyone was looking for office furniture yeah. at home, but at the time we weren't selling chairs online. And so actually we've strengthened that bit of the business as a result of this as well. And so I think we've come through it as a stronger business as a result of it um, and definitely more sales focused yeah. as well. So, uh, yeah, but it was tough, very, very tough. Every, th every, every time you come through any kind of adversity, it's always one of those things where you've you've learned you've learned things from it. Because yeah. if you haven't learned anything from it, you wouldn't have got you wouldn't have got through it. Yeah. Twenty twenty was brutal, absolutely. I mean, if you're yeah, you're selling office furniture to people that aren't in offices, that's a you know, I challenge any salesperson. <laughs> yeah. all, all the people that are applying for an apprentice, yeah. Yeah. The, they're the best yeah. salesperson in Europe. Yeah. Try selling office furniture to people that aren't in offices. That's that's a tough gig. Um, but you know, I think I think the company. We're in a much, much better. We're in a much, much better place now than we were in 2019. Um, 2020. And we were a good place in 2019. Yeah. It was our record year in 2019. Wow. 2020, we genuinely thought was going to be our smash it out of the park year. Our first quarter, we'd done six months worth of Target within three wow. months. And we all patted ourselves on the we, back. We were all going, this pop, is pop amazing. <laughs> We've cracked it. And then the, and then the, the tumbleweeds <laughs> blew in. <laughs> like, and, um, yeah. Yeah, it I was... remember walking through the warehouse at one point and going, that's it. The we've lost the business the, the the we even looked at it because the um, lease on the warehouse was up in July and so there was an opportunity where effectively we we could shrink it down to a much smaller size and we looked and sort of said well actually is it worth us 
at this stage Let's really see. scaling it back. Let's but by that, keep it but by that yeah. time, by July, things had started picking up again. I think people. They? I think what happened. I think what really happened with COVID in terms of the office space was there was this massive knee jerk thing of mm. obviously everybody, everybody going home. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it took. It took the corporate marketplace. I mean, I don't think the corporate marketplace has as a hundred percent got to grips with the with work now yeah. but probably four to five months in it it was starting to dawn on people that this wasn't a couple of months it's over mm-hmm. let's all go back to how we were kind of thing and then some of our bigger clients realized that they actually needed to put some things in place now um, and that's when they started the phone or email started going again mm-hmm. to say what do we do there was a there was um announcement from the government that it was there was going to be a dual responsibility on employers in terms of home working set up and mm. office working set up that for us was huge mm. because all of a sudden it's it was it was um, um, the, the pressure was back on employers to make sure that their staff were safe at home yeah. and if they weren't safe at home then they needed to get them back into the office so that 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 was a huge you know it was a huge yeah. turning point for us and and what's happened in the last in the last sort of two to three years is companies have slowly understood a little bit more mm. um, what is hybrid, what does hybrid mean, um, you know, and that's ultimately going to be the model that pretty much everybody's going to be working on in some in some form. There will be permanent staff in the office. There will probably be some permanent staff that are home mm. and the bulk of your staff will do three days in and two days at home or however however it structures but certainly yeah. flexibility is the thing that's come out of covid that companies have struggled mm. to understand yeah and we um, and we're, for, we're forced to embrace wasn't we? yeah how, how many people would it like in the special professional services i guess that were like solicitors law firms etc and, and accountants where you know you're productive if you're sitting in front of me yeah. working nine yeah. to five and that was the, what's always done so that's what we do everyone's got to be in the office but actually forced to go yes well, we've got to go home we've got to yeah. look at other ways yeah. of working you can actually you are actually really productive and does it matter if you're working eight till three and then going and picking or yeah. doing whatever you're doing in the afternoon and then Absolutely. you're coming back and working actually is that job being done great and i think people have started to look at that and embrace it i think there's a and like you said i think there's a real balance i think we went through a stage of going actually we don't need to be in an office at all we can all be at home all the time mm. well this is something we're going to later talking about sort of culture and stuff and what yeah. that looks like but actually you've got to have that like, sense of community I think for me like, I'm a people person so for me like being around people connection and you know yeah. going to events or being out and about I, I, I sort of crave that and I think actually yeah. as a society we do need that mm, a little bit yes. to a degree and as well from from younger people coming through like learning and stuff being in that environment that we still need so i do i think you're spot on i think actually there's this whole flexibility hybrid thing that's actually everyone's embraced and need needs mm. to i guess but i think it i think i think the biggest thing about home working is exactly what you said was it, it kind of it destigmatized the home where there was mm. always a bit of a people who work from home don't do any work mm. you know and people who were in offices full time and there was other members of staff that were allowed to work from home mm. were just um you know I, they're shirking we, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I always you know I've, I've 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 joked in the office about yeah. you know oh well, you know we won't be able to call them now because home's under the hammer is on yeah. or that you know that 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 kind of thing because yeah. that's all people who do who work from yeah. home they just watch <laughs> yeah. that and cash in the attic you've made that joke in a while <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i think it was um what I'm what I'm seeing now in the workplace is the fact that there's been numerous studies done on productivity at home and productivity in the workplace, mm-hmm. and there doesn't seem to be any distinguishable difference between that. Mm-hmm. But what companies are now seeing in terms of their the overall benefit is that if staff don't interact with each other in an office, mm-hmm. there's all those little sparky conversations call them water cooler moments and that kind of stuff that don't that don't happen if everything's scheduled on teams call if everything's got to be scheduled onto a a zoom call or however it is that you're doing it um and that's where one of the things that um a lot of clients are talking to us about at the moment is we don't quite know what that looks like but we need to get people back in the office whether that be 
the office just becomes the meeting space where all the meetings take place in the office yeah. or you know that kind of that kind of uh, do we set up some co-working spaces so people can you know come in and collaborate and have some meetings yeah, yeah. But, but they've also made sure that actually they know that they need to elevate the office so it actually becomes a place where people want to come to. Yeah. It, it's a bit like the surroundings we've got here. Yeah. They're inspirational. Yeah. You sort of you come down and you sort of think, oh, actually, yeah, there's a buzz about it, isn't yeah. there? Which you don't always get when you're working at home, obviously, yeah. and you're sort of trying to put the washing machine you know and then you're, <laughs> yeah. you're doing all the other boring sort of jobs as well around yeah. it. it there is as you say it's about the community yeah. that you have around you and that's really important for people's mel- mental well-being as oh, well ma- massive absolutely yeah i completely agree and I, i'd be interested actually just from a f- from the point of view of how many people like individually that you did actually then go and look at it and from your point of view did that model obviously of your business change so much so that you actually will we're doing assessments with people at their, their homes or obviously mm. online. But you've yeah. done a lot of stuff you do. I think I've, I've listened to, I think you've done a talk previously that I'd listened to where you said about obviously people working from home and yeah. um, and you can do the self-assessments now on Zoom. So yeah. it made it more accessible yeah. for yep. people yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So because how many of them stories did you hear people, oh, I'm just working up at the kitchen table or I'm yeah. working in a bedroom sitting yeah. on a bed and like... You, I've spoke to a few people on here. You sort of think about that process from a HR point of view yeah. a little bit further down the line. No. How many people are going to come back? Yeah. And, and yeah. I guess that's where you guys were able to come in and solve that problem for people. I think there's a little bit of a leeway at the moment mm. still, but I think that kind of window is closing, mm. if you like, because there are still an awful lot of employers out there that don't realise that they have responsibility for how someone works at home. Mm. And I think also people are starting now to get all the aches and pains having worked badly for the last couple of years Mm. and I think the scary thing is how much younger people are that we're seeing Mm. as well Mm. and so it is the people in their 20s as opposed to people sort of in their 40s and 50s that are now coming through going I've got backache I've got RSI I've got Mm. neck ache and that's one of the really scary things and a lot of it can be pinpointed to how these people are working at home Mm. because they just been given a budget and they've gone out and bought really pretty furniture but it isn't necessarily compliant furniture Mm. and so they are sitting on the bar stools they are sitting on Mm. the kitchen chairs and that's having a a real direct impact now on how people are feeling Mm. so I think that was one of the big things that came out of Covid in terms of the flexible the flexibility of workforce um, I think initially there would be a, there was a, there was almost a feeling that the the older the older generations in the workforce would be the people that are more traditional and mm. would want to get back to the office mm. um, in that respect and the millennial Gen Z kind of things are, are used to working on bean bags and in coffee shops and and all this kind of stuff that that that's that sort of come into the the working environment mm. but actually. It was almost the reverse of that because quite a lot of the older employees were the ones with spare bedrooms, were the ones that had offices in the garden, yeah. were the ones that could make themselves very comfortable and very set up. Mm. Whereas actually the Gen Zs and the Millennials were in their bedroom and they yeah. were in a three Studio bedroom, they, flat. They, three yeah. bedroom apartment with two other two other friends. Mm. Um, and actually there wasn't a way of getting them set up. They didn't have enough space to get set up properly Mm. Um, or they were finding the fact that if their desk and workspace was in their bedroom it was having a big impact on their their mental well-being so yeah you look back at that period and it was just like you said everything was up in there it was such a learning curve for so many a couple of things obviously just taken out from what you been saying as well actually how you as so many businesses and the word that gets used a lot on here how we pivot and we adapt and stuff and I think as business owners that's what we need to do isn't it you have to you have to move with the times you have to adapt whatever whatever hurdles thrown at us we go I think Ryan Hill said it on here once he said look the, the, the option you got you either pack up and go home and if that's not an option then yeah. you've got to find a solution and I mm. guess especially especially in your industry ultimately what you do for a living is solve solutions for people or, yeah. you know within their workspaces and that so, so when you relay that to the actual business model that you're running as well what what I'm keen to actually just explore is what that at that point like you said right at that beginning was there some serious conversations at home going like 
actually this could be the end and what what does that what does that look like yeah very much so because we looked at it and we sort of said well could we just do it that i just become an assessor and we don't supply any products whatsoever we effectively outsource one of those to a competitor um, could it be that we just sort of shrink it down to the project side of the business and we work from our spare bedroom at home and Dave will sell the odd project and I'll do all of the paperwork for it and we won't bother doing anything else and that should just about kind of get us through and we looked at that and that was something that that we thought long and hard about Mm. but there was more of a risk element to that because obviously there'd be some months where we'd have a lot of income and then some months where we'd have none Mm. and we both ultimately one of the beauties of the the company is there's always been a balance to it there's always been the health and safety the ergonomic side which is like the steady eddy side of the business we can almost guarantee every month exactly what's coming in and then you have the love your workspace side of the business which supplies the big office projects where we refit spaces and that that's peaks and troughs so you can be working on something for six months and all of a sudden it comes in but you can also be working on something for six months and it doesn't come in Mm. and so the two sides have always balanced themselves out very Mm. well in some ways and so yes we did think about reducing it but then ultimately we we felt that the business was sound enough and we could already see by that stage that everything was creeping back again that we felt that okay so 2020 was going to be a very difficult year but we already felt 2021 was going to be a better year and it was and 2022 was even better and sort of we're we're back to sort of the same level that we were at 2019 2022 was record Yes. So we beat, we yeah. beat, we really? beat, yeah, Amazing. yeah, that. we beat, yeah. we beat 2019's turnover, um, only by a smidge, but it was yeah. still, it was, yeah, it was still, you know, a bounce yeah. back record year. Um, I think we were both by the end of 2020. That that was one thing I don't think I'd realised as how exhausted the two of us were, because we kind of, I remember one of our staff saying to us, oh look we've done it we, we sort of smashed through the million again, mm. and are you not pleased about that? And I was like, oh yeah. And I was like, that's not really the way to be, is it? And I think it was only where we've taken a bit more time off this year that we've just suddenly gone, oh, yeah, actually, we were quite tired. Mm. And I think it was just the last couple of years where you keep going, you keep going, you keep going, and then you suddenly go, oh, actually, I'm a bit knackered. (laughs) As soon as as you have time to assess the situation, where you're just doing that kind of, yeah, you know, you're on the treadmill kind of thing. It's got to keep coming. It's got to keep coming, and that, and then when survival you, mode, exactly Ooh. that, exactly that, and then you, you, you know, you switch the treadmill off and get off of it, yeah. and actually go, yeah. oh, I'm shattered. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was. I think it was, yeah, it was one of those things where you just, you know, we are, we're such, we are such a better organisation for it, though. Mm. Yeah. It, it really allowed us to drill down on some weaker weaker areas of the yeah. business uh, we've we've got almost a completely different team than we had wow. in 2019 um because the business has pivoted slightly um, in a no different i way think at all. i think having all that time off on furlough gave other people a chance yeah. to think as yeah. well as to what they wanted to do yeah. we obviously had to make a couple of redundancies um and then the person who at the time was doing sales support for us decided that she'd got to a stage where her kids had grown up left and she actually wanted to do something completely different and go back and retrain to go back into the legal world and it was really hard at the time because you sort of felt it was all falling apart but actually that was the one thing that covid did teach sort of both myself and dave is actually we can do any role within the business and although it's bloody hard and you don't necessarily want to do it actually you can jump back in and go well actually what's not working and it gave me a really good chance of getting back to doing some of those jobs to kind of going well this isn't working what how do we fix this what what piece of software can we bring in that makes it easier and so we we have changed and we are sort of very fundamentally a a sort of a a lot more streamlined now I think so but it was me and me and Ashley and some screwdrivers and a van full of desks yeah. Going out to various houses in East Sussex, installing desks yeah. into people's houses because yeah. one of our 
one of one of our key accounts um, out there was was basically rolling out um, a sort of cost effective desk for all of their home users. But it was wow. like, well, we haven't got we haven't got fitters. We haven't got you know. Um, and to be honest, we haven't got anything else to do. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an order. Yeah. Get it in. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there we you know we were yeah mm. finding ourselves out and you know heading out towards. Uh, Bexhill Hill and Eastbourne and um, St Leonard's and Rye and all of these different houses that we were that we were going into um, installing desks because there was you know it, it, people were placing orders and there was no one else to do it so it was yeah you know, it was back on the tools yeah. as they say but you know we needed doing and and you do it and that has to be like again when when, it, when it's yours when it's your baby and you're, and you're doing it you do just you go like I said. Packing up to going home is not an option, so we are going to crack on. And then you just hold the old yeah. sleeves up, yeah. get stuck in. Yeah. And like you say, you just... Uh, and so many... And, it's, and what's what's great, actually, then, to listen to that story and listen to you talk about it now. And then, and hopefully, like you said, maybe taking a bit of time off this year or whatever, but you you, you take that moment to look back and go, we did get through that. And, yeah. and actually give yourselves a moment yeah. to tap on your back and go, yeah, well, we, yeah. we've done all right there and we've yeah. come out. And, it's, uh, and enjoy those moments as well, because when you're right in that thick of it, that's yeah. a tough period place to be. I think, it's, I think it's one of the things that business owners generally are the worst at mm. is actually... Because there's no boss, because there's no sales director or yeah. MD to come round and go, yeah, good job on that one. Mm. There's no one to do that for yeah, you. You yeah. have to do it yourself. Yeah, point, yeah. And I think generally, I think people are quite are quite bad at doing mm, it. I mean, great. the fact that we've still got a business, yeah. so whether or not we're doing better or worse than 2019, yeah. we're still in business. We still employ still seven people's wages in addition to ours. Yeah. We're still there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you ha- yeah, every now and then you have to kind of, you know, raise a glass of something or something and go, we're st- yeah. I think if you asked our kids, though, about the whole period, I'm not sure they'd have much fun. <laughs> yeah, <that's true>. yeah, <laughs> I think it's true. at one stage, our 16-year-old at the time was homeschooling our 10, 10, 11-year-old, wow. and that wasn't going down very well <laughs> at all. But it's like we didn't have the time to do yeah, it, so sure, I was like, sure. well, you're, you're okay, you see, you do that, and the arguments were quite legendary. And then the time the second lockdown came actually is he did have schoolwork at that stage so harry used to come into the office with us and used to do his lessons with my mum over zoom <laughs> so wow. wow but i think you English just make your mum and maths with yeah me. <laughs> i think you just make it and i think yeah. that's the one thing as business owners you just go i've got to make this work we'll find a way to do it somehow yeah. so i love that yeah and yeah the homeschooling well wow. i was, was very uh, jealous of everyone on furlough though yeah <laughs> especially because that's so Oh, it was I know. Incredible, wasn't I know. It? And because um, that first time, obviously, I hadn't started county business clubs at that point. Um, I still had the magazine, but not that many people were spending lots of money on marketing and and, and putting stuff in. Them. And then obviously, Fernball was completely stopped. So I was not. So I was doing a lot of the yeah. homeschooling, and Kelly was working, but at the same time, trying to go. Well, what do I do to yeah. keep in contact and keep managing the business? And, and it was it, it, part of me do just. There's a part of you that goes, oh, you know what? If I was just employed by someone, <laughs> no. I could go and yeah. Yeah, I, know. And I could take the kids down yeah. to the beach and I'm yeah. having a great time. And instead, I'm worrying. Because yeah. similar to you, we're directors of small companies fell into that little gap, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. Where we go, I can go on furlough, yeah. but I can't do anything. Yeah. And if, but and if I do, get money. And they, I only get up whatever the director's salary. Yeah. Go, wow, that's yeah. a really yeah. rubbish place to be. But yeah, yeah it was I, I, what I did learn, a big learning was that I'm not a teacher. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Hats off. Yeah, hats yeah. off. To the, hats pay off. the Massive. teachers whatever yeah, they want. Absolutely. <laughs> that. Yeah. Don't send them home to me. Yeah. Uh, they went back after the second lockdown. Kelly did have. Um, she did take some furlough, um, and she ended up doing. Uh, she done the homeschooling, but being a solicitor, very organised, and she was like. They went back. They got a letter from the school after, or an email from the school after going, can they really come on, the kids? I said, oh, we're not a homeschool day. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't I, didn't that. Get that. I didn't get that one. But they did learn how to cook Clefty Co. And oh, now there I'm, you I'm go. going with that. I'm going with that. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to say something about one of our sponsors, EMC Corporate Finance. Trust must be earned, especially in business. It goes both ways and takes time to build. That's why you need an advisor with a proven track record who understands its value and more importantly, the value you place on your business. EMC Corporate Finance is built on a legacy of trust. For over 30 years, they've been advising and supporting entrepreneurs, guiding them through the challenges of private company ownership. 
Whether you're looking to raise investment, accelerate growth, or crystallize value with a profitable exit, the team are here to help. So if you're ready to take that next step, let EMC be your guide. For more information, go to www.emcltd.co.uk. Okay, back to the podcast. I want, I want to talk about, obviously, we're talking about business owners and what that looks like. And it can sometimes, as a solopreneur, or whatever, but sometimes be quite a lonely place. But I'm interested with the husband and wife and the benefits of actually having someone to lean on and a partner in that sense, all in, like not just your partner in life, but actually in the business as well. Talk, talk to me about that dynamic and the, the benefits, I guess, of that. Because when you are in the thick of it, you're like at a time like that, for example, you're both in it together. And that, what, what's that like? Um, tricky at times. Um, good. Uh, the vast, vast, the vast majority of times, it's, it's it's brilliant. I think I think for us, what's particularly good is the fact that we are, um, from a job structure point of view, we are polar opposites. Mm. Absolutely polar opposites. Joe is the strategist, um, the planner, um, the driver of the ship. Um, and as it's been politely put to me, I'm the gobby sales one, um, <laughs> which doesn't sound anywhere near as grand as the strategist and that. But I think it's one of those things where Joe brings a lot of skills to the business that are different to my skills. So mm. if there's something that needs on the steering side and she needs to fall back on, on me, then I'm there for that. And if the sales, i.e. 2020 and that kind of stuff, it was, it was mm. Joe sort of, well, emotionally as much as anything else, propping me up because I couldn't go out there and do what I wanted to to do. Yeah. You say that because I felt you were propping me up in some ways because you were so much better at keeping contact with the staff and doing all of that, whereas, whereas I just couldn't. I, I just didn't have the capacity to try and look after them as, as well as myself, the kids, parents and things like that. So I, I do think... It, and I do think also as well, we, we're quite even-tempered. We're, we're not a mm. couple that tends to row a lot. Mm. And so we do, we, we, we do talk things through a fair amount. Um, but there were, particularly in the early days, we had to talk a lot about kind of communication because one of my big things was you can't talk to me like that in the office as if you were at home and it has to still be a very professional basis mm. that, that yeah. we're dealing with that and we had problems with that initially didn't we well, so, in, the, in the early days yeah. of the business yeah 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 no absolutely but i think it's i think the even tempered thing is massive mm. um actually i think it's one of those things where if if you are a couple that that spars or you know yeah. that kind of thing then it's it could be it could be a lot more it could be a lot more difficult mm. um to do but yeah, I just think we both just get on with it, people, mm. as well. I think it's one of those, it is one of those sort of traits that we've, we've both got of, well, this needs doing. Except for the housework. Well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, Joe. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did we just turn the volume up on that one? <laughs> Dave, no comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, moving on. <laughs> but things like that. Actually, that caused huge problems very early on. So we got a cleaner. So you yeah, yeah, you yeah, do yeah. just, you find a solution, don't you, yeah, to yeah. it. And actually, one of the things that was very useful for us, and we haven't done it in the last couple of years, but for a good chunk of when the business was growing, we had a business mentor. So Simon Conroy um, was our business mentor for a long time. And actually, he was tremendously useful. Because mm. obviously, if you've got two people running a company if one of you disagrees how do you work out what's the right way There's to go no, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so actually having that third person was really useful because we both talked to Simon about it and whichever one Simon sort of sided with then we yeah. progress with that route that's really so. that's really interesting actually and a great solution I guess to that sense because you're right actually as a partnership as well if you know if our husband and wife disagree on things yeah. all the time, don't they? Yeah. So you go, yeah. oh, but you 
work it out and you yeah. do well, you go with win. what the wife yeah. wants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 99% of the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the compromise is whatever Joe wants. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but when, when you look at it from a, obviously a business point of view, you both potentially different opinions on certain things. Yeah. And ultimately, you both want the best for the business. Yeah. yeah. But it's maybe a difference of opinion. Yeah. And then having that third person, like you said, what yeah. a key yeah. thing that... Well, I'd, yeah, for anyone listening, I guess they yes. are in that, or thinking about going into that yeah. sort of thing, that would be great advice. Yeah, to I, th- I don't think it has to be a husband and wife, even no, no. if it's the two of you, you running a business. Mean? Sometimes, because I think sometimes one of you will have a slightly stronger character or will be slightly better mm-hmm. at arguing than the other one. <laughs> and so... <laughs> I'm the, I'm My wife's there. a solicitor, so she, <laughs> so she argues probably, for a living. Yeah, so she's probably really good. <laughs> Whereas probably Dave is the stronger arguer in, in our sort of relationship dynamic, yeah. dynamic but that does mean one I've got much better at I don't tend to <laughs> much better much, at arguing, much better at arguing. <laughs> no that's, no. What, that, Sorry, that's no. what a business mentor <laughs> brought to our relationship Joe's a poor proficient arguer no <laughs> what I mean is I don't come because sometimes I'll come with an idea and I'll start discussing it and then Dave will poke all the holes in it so I've learned now that if actually there's something I'm really really absolutely fundamentally agree on i make sure that actually the argument is there yeah. and that actually i've really thought something through because i can almost guarantee that dave will put all the holes in there <laughs> and i need to be able to answer that but again that's really good from a business point of view because he'll approach things and look at things differently to me and so you you by the time we've decided to go forward with the direction it's been pulled apart and we've looked at it and kind of gone actually well what happens if this happens well okay this is our answer to it and so again it, it's it's n- now i think when when we decide which way to do something actually we go th- go for it completely because we, we're, we're pretty confident it'll work so yeah that's a great way of looking and, and you're right for any any business owner listening and anyone thinking about certain aspects of the business actually it is in, so important to not pick holes necessarily yeah. but actually look at other aspects and what could be the pitfalls because otherwise you do sometimes you do look at things and it that, that looks like a great idea yeah. and it's really nice and shiny and yeah. I, I jump two feet into that yeah. and, you, and then you look back and go oh I didn't think about that and that yeah didn't. whereas if you've got that good relationship where you are able to go well yeah but what about that and what about that and asking yeah. those questions yeah that's yeah. quite key isn't it Dave's a lot more numerically minded than I am so again I'll look on the o- sort of the overview and I go yeah that looks all right but Dave will drill down and look at the numbers mm. which again is so important in a business yeah. it, it's not you can't just look at the sort of the top level you, you've got to look underneath yeah. it and actually understand where some of those numbers are coming from yeah. I think that's so, the, that is the pri- that's the primary difference between the yeah. the business owner small business and big business mm. that was when, you know when you yeah. had your corporate when when corporate role yeah um, in the marketing teams and that kind of stuff there are big conversations that can happen about are we exploring this are we exploring this as an avenue kind of thing and you don't need to do all the finite stuff mm. at that point mm. because there might be somebody else in the department to do it it might be a completely different department mm. but when it's just the two of you it's like no we need to thrash this out there's no you know there is there is no one else there is no one else no. to go to simon was very very useful for that as yeah. well and yeah. he would you know we've had occasions where he shouted us both down and told us that we were both wrong yeah. um so you know it was I know, you know, I know you've got your idea, but I think you're both wrong. And actually, I think you should do this. And we've sat yeah. there and gone, yeah, actually, that makes a lot of sense as well. Yeah. So um, having, whether it be, you know, whether it be a parent, whether it be a, an outside force or somebody yeah. else that you respect in business, having an outside influence mm. if there is just two of you is yeah. i think it's really helpful yeah really helpful no. organizations like the md hub were really yeah. good as well so oh, okay. and obviously your networking as well <laughs> thank you very much for <laughs> <laughs> um i want to as well like look, work-life balance we alluded to a little bit earlier and there's something i often talk about but I, I, I generally struggle with that trying to get that balance um we sort of mentioned a little bit offline about what does that look like to people i guess like i say for, for me sometimes i can go home and if i don't want to talk about a business i can almost try and switch off from it. i think never really switch off which is part of my problem but i guess i can talk to kelly about other stuff or whatever but what i'm keen how do you use achieve that with a work-life balance where actually you're both in it you're both in the business so much 
all the time where like we mentioned earlier about talking about it but have you got that thing where we can go right actually we're going out for dinner we're gonna it's just gonna be about me and you and not talk about the business is uh, what does that look like we um, always talk about the business when I we think, go out I think dinner. we always end up yeah but there's I mean we've got we've got two well second one will be a teenager in July we've got two teenage kids sports clubs yeah. running around I'd say we probably only spend about three hours a week yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah that's in the, true in the same room <laughs> yeah um, so people will tell me something and then they'll talk yeah, to Dave and they'll presume that I've told him and I've completely forgotten to tell him like <laughs> critical information yeah, there's definitely and stuff. a massive assumption that if either party is told something yeah. the other party will find out <laughs> yeah. and, that, and that, that just doesn't happen I don't think we don't I don't think we I guess like even for, like around the table with the kids as well yeah. and stuff like that is it I think like what, what, what would they think like is it that it's all that we talk a lot business? about business yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. which Harry, isn't a, 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 like there's a part of me yeah. that thinks listens to that and thinks actually it's because you're so passionate yeah. about it and well that's what a great thing like, and, and actually how inspiring that is for them to watch both mum and dad building this business and yeah. passionate about something like because all we want our kids is actually to just find something they're passionate about and follow that whatever yeah. that looks like and that's certainly not furniture for either of our kids at the moment is it so <laughs> no. I, I, I don't know whether that passion has been read as, <laughs> no. well, I don't want to do that yeah. um, <laughs> because neither I of think, them I think hard, but I do think hard work has been drilled into yeah, they them yeah, they both and so p- particularly our older daughter she works tremendously hard it, it's mm. like she's found herself a great saturday job where she's an assistant swimming teacher she volunteers at a care home she, she is a hard worker mm. she works hard at her school work and i think harry will be the same as he grows up as well so mm. i do think that when you have like parents who run their own company that actually that sort of gets drilled into the kids as well is is the fact that actually it's not all like i think i think the other thing that kids that we've passed on i I think they they have a tremendous understanding of value they have Mm. a really really good understanding of what things cost how you get things how you work to get things and things you know there isn't a magical money tree at the bottom of the garden that everyone goes to Mm. um and I think they've got a very, very good yeah. understanding of, yeah, the value of things. Oh, um, and I think that, you know, that's that's something that yeah. I don't think everybody and has. But I think, yeah. Then and that helped, definitely. obviously, with COVID, because literally all the bills were slashed, including their pocket money. So it's like, oh, wow. no, we're just like stopping everything. There was nothing to go out and spend it on. But, but... Funny enough, when you talk about going back to that work-life balance thing, I, I do feel like our company is almost our third child, mm-hmm. and so that sits at the dinner table with us in the evenings, and we do, we try not to have too many conversations, and I think we're quite lucky in the fact that the business doesn't afford us a lot of stress mm. and so we don't bring that stress home in some ways but they have seen that stress come home during the pandemic yeah, yeah, as well not day-to-day so, stuff we no. like to have our stress in massive global lumps yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it, have you noticed? Nothing, nothing too trivial yeah. it's only when i was writing down things every 10 years so 2010 we had like this yeah. like brink of bankruptcy yeah, and then crisis. 2020 obviously the pandemic i'm a bit worried about we 2030. need to be out we need to be out yeah. Yeah. 2029 2029 <laughs> yeah we're gone we're off <laughs> yeah we're, we're off. winning yeah we are not waiting till 2030 yeah. so yeah. but it's uh, interesting as well listening to like, like like you said just taking again through the challenges that we learned we ultimately want to learn something with 2010 going actually we don't want to be in this position again. Let's make sure we've got this pot. To, yep. So when 2020, how many businesses got to 2020, me included, actually, and, and went, shit, I haven't got six months worth of money or three months or two, yeah, five days, whatever that looks like. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're in a actually a difficult position, but what you learned from that challenge back in 2010, yeah. actually yeah. taking that into a, such a massive... Uh, I guess for people listening, that's such a massive thing to take yeah. away. Yeah. That you go, actually... 
got to plan for those things. Look, no one no one had global pandemic no. in their in their, no, no. In their, in their When you write your disaster plan. recovery <laughs> plan, I don't think you see we'd we'd all we'd gone through and we'd modelled the fact well what happens if love your workspace goes down, what happens if posture people goes mm. down? But we had never modelled what happens if both sides oh, of the dear. business go down. And so but having said that actually within three months it was climbing again mm. and things you have to pivot you have to change and it exposed that weakness that the e-commerce wasn't strong enough so again that will be a stronger part in our business going forward as well yeah i love that well, and so you, you've obviously mentioned love your workspace being we i'm introduced you obviously as posture people but a division obviously love your workspace and um, all what that i guess <laughs> guess entails what Talk to me about uh, with the culture of the company. You mentioned obviously about the team and working with them and, and, and building a new team really over the last couple of years as well. What, talk, talk to me a little bit about the culture within, within the company. Well, I think, I mean, team, team fit is probably the, the, biggest, the biggest thing that we look at with um, new members of staff or anybody joining the company. Um, we have um, we've got a fabulous we've got an absolutely fabulous team we're really really lucky but they're very very eclectic mm. um, I would say outside of work that they they share almost almost nothing in common with each <laughs> other but get them in the office or get them on a team night out or a team event and that kind of stuff and actually they really pull together mm. uh, well um, I think I think shared shared common values um, I think one of the things that Joe does particularly well is installing um, our company values as part of the um, sort of onboarding process um, and getting people to buy into those values. Mm. Um, one of the things that struck me was the last, so that our most recent member of staff um, on her interview, her closing, and it was a job for a sales role. So as a salesperson, I particularly like this. <laughs> but her closing point of her interview was, I know this is unprofessional, but I just want to say, I think you've created a fantastic company. I would love to work here. Now, whether that's a, whether that's a salesperson cliche or whether that's you know, from the heart, yeah. it was just a really, really nice thing to hear. Yeah. Um, and I think if I would hope that if you spoke to any one of our team individually, they would all have a very, very similar thread in, in as much as we're all pulling in the same direction. We all want to have as much fun as we can mm. whilst we're pulling in the same direction. Um, and it's it's literally, yeah, this shared journey. We've always looked at it as you might not share our surname, but it ultimately it's a, it is a family business is the culture that we, that. the mm. culture that we try and um, and have within the firm is that it's a family business. So you might not be a, you might not be a blood, <laughs> but it's um, it is that family business culture. Would you agree? Yeah, with that? absolutely, absolutely. Um, I love that. I love that. What a brilliant thing, Pat. <laughs> and, and she come on board. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> come here, you start. Yeah, I'm closed. Where do I sign? <laughs> yeah. Is my because I. I Again, culture is something that I find I find fascinating within a business. I, me and you spoke about it before about when yeah. I, the salon. I think I got the culture very wrong and didn't you know, my first business and it didn't work out. And I thought that's why I find it so interesting to listen to. How, but I'm, I'm interested as well, like listening to that. I'm I'm assuming that similar similar company values to actually your own personal core values is that that they marry up pretty much. Would you say? Or? Yes, I think so, because the kind of the values of the business, so fun is one of them. Mm. So it's like work is such a large portion of people's lives. Mm. It's like you've got to do something that you are interested mm. in, that you do, that you are passionate, that you are enjoying when you're doing mm. it. We don't expect everyone to be as passionate as us, but we do expect everybody to treat it like their own business as well. Mm. Um, we tend to find 
people either stay with us for a very long time or a very short time because it's not just us that weed people out it, it's the rest of the team will come to me and go that person's not working that person's not working and right. so normally within three months somebody's either there or they've they've gone basically and we haven't we've been really lucky we we've we've got quite a strong recruitment process we so we haven't had to go through that but again even the people that have left we've sort of spoken to them said look it's not working out we need you to sort of let's find you a position that you're going to enjoy more somewhere else really um and uh, other values are things like entrepreneurial spirit. So we, we encourage people to almost like have little sections of the business so that they think of that as their section of the business. We we talk very openly about our numbers. We go through each week as to effectively go through the P&L sheet with them and so yeah, that they can see that as well. Yeah, that's yeah. Really we don't I'm, hide much from yeah. the staff at all. That's really no, interesting. Just intimated that there is something that we're hiding yeah. from the staff. <laughs> no. Like um, no, we're not. When they're listening to this, we're not hiding anything, <laughs> I promise you. I mean, as part, as part of the recruitment process, the staff totally have the power of veto. The final part of the recruitment process is that the person spends half an hour in the office with the team and they would totally have a power of veto. If me and Joe thought somebody was the best candidate we've ever seen and the team came back and went, can't work with them, that would be enough. Really? Wow. Mm. Because ultimately... They work, yes, we're a team, but um, the way that it's struck, the way that the company's structured with the sort of two divisions, mm. um, any new members of staff at the moment won't, won't be working with me directly because I, uh, myself and, and Rachel, who's the sales support side of it, are, are effectively siphoned off. Mm. And Joe, in terms of the strategy and the planning and the marketing and the mm. HR and the ops role that she does, is effectively a little bit away from the business. So they are going to be in with the team full time. Mm. Um, so if that's not going to fit, um, uh, and we've seen, we've seen both sides of the business. We've seen how the business can transform if you put the right member of staff into the right place. And, you can, and we've also seen, you know, okay. how the business will transform if you have the wrong member of staff, do, you know, doing the wrong thing. Um, so I think team, team fit, team culture, and, and nurturing that mm. is a huge part of of, of our yeah. success. I love that. I, it, it, couple of things about that there's transparency I, mm. I, th- I think that's amazing thing. I had um, who's a guy Matt Turner come on it you know from Creative Pod I don't know if you know he runs a marketing agency come on in it um, we spoke a little bit about during the pandemic as well but he was really really open about the numbers mm. said look this is this is where we are this is yeah. how much we've got in the bank yeah. and this is yeah. if, if if we don't do anything between now and then you're not going to have a job in yeah. none of us are going to be here but if yeah. we do x y and z and, yep. we're, and they've grown massively over the period yeah. and come out of it etc and up I, I, I was always very conscious of that especially at the salon less so now but especially at the salon thinking i can't share in that yeah. we're in real shit at the minute and i can't share that with anyone yeah. like this it's yeah. my responsibility my, yep. and I, I thought but actually how do you how do you create a culture? How do you get the buy in from people? As you mentioned, like you said, by creating something yeah. where they're never going to see it like it's their business because it's not. But you can put all them tools like you are doing and creating an amazing culture where actually, oh, it's not my business, but I feel part. Yeah. This part of it is mine. Yeah. Encouraging that entrepreneurial spirit and, and actually sharing the the numbers with them. And w- was you openly transparent? I guess at the top with COVID and stuff like that, was you still like that with? numbers and stuff around that or was it less so i don't necessarily think we got well because they were all furloughed yeah yeah, yeah. i don't necessarily think we got down to the brass tacks of it because no, no. probably a phone call that you don't want to hear that isn't yeah, yeah, going to yeah. be motivational in any way shape, <laughs> yeah, form sure. is you're on furlough and the company's really not doing very yeah, well yeah. um i was going to coming back to the original point we were talking about the enjoyment of furlough we had that conversation with one of our key members of staff and he said what you had to remember or what you don't remember because you didn't go through the experience is I didn't know if I had a job at any point through furlough. Mm. So now looking back on it, if I'd have known now what I knew then, I could have had like the best three months of my life. But he said every day it was almost a question of, I don't know if the company's going to get through this. I don't know if I've got a job at the end. So there was a bit of stress. I don't think we've ever, I don't think we've ever really got down 
in the in the like in the bad times. No, I don't yeah. think we've ever really done that kind of look. This is this is where no, we are. Yeah. No, no, but no. I think what we did share with them were the sales figures. So yes. they knew it was bad because effectively they knew what we should be doing each mm. month and what we actually were doing. But then we also shared actually this is growing, yeah. so they could see that at that point yeah. and. Ju- it was July time we had to bring one of the BEMSA staff back from furlough yep. and actually then once he was in that helped again with the dynamic mm. because that was a dedicated salesperson that was coming in to help Dave to push things on yeah. further and again they could see that as a step forward as mm. well and it sort of trickled from there where we sort of then started growing them like okay now we need somebody else back and mm. it, it was a very gradual process mm. but yeah, we, we shared that aspect that we I, were growing. Yeah. I think it's I think it's really, uh, and obviously it's why we do it. I think it's really important because it gives the staff a really really good understanding of the inherent costs of running a business, mm-hmm. um, and what the sales each is. It's it's great for them to hear about the sales, and I think without the transparency of the Monday morning meeting going through the figures. It kind of just looks like, oh, Dave and Joe must have a massive house <laughs> and you know, dealer, there's me battling away. And actually, I think it's a bit more of a like, oh, oh, that costs that much. Oh, rent and oh, mm. oh, and rates, oh, and electric and oh, vehicles. Vehicles are expensive, aren't you know? And it was, mm. and it's one of those things where, you know, a monthly sales figure looks amazing, but actually, you having a much, much better understanding of what's left in the pot mm. after that monthly I think just I think it just sort of grounds the staff yeah. a little bit more into thinking that yeah we don't we haven't got 19 houses and, and is, get to work by helicopter yeah. um, there is a perception of, of yeah oh you've run your own business oh, absolutely yeah, like, yeah. yeah exactly yeah. Oh, you that. must be rolling in it <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah and we don't do badly yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but no. we're probably not yeah. rolling in this stage <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. not quite got a helicopter yet. no yeah, exactly. definitely not <laughs> yeah. I've, got, I've got an electric bike <laughs> small steps yeah so exactly. Small steps. exactly yeah Burgess Hill Porsche is not yeah. on speed dial <laughs> no yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> love it well, look, uh, uh, I want to. I want to. I've got to ask this question because I'm at the time of recording this. I'm. Uh, I'm about to start a comedy course, so I do want to. I do want to talk to you a little bit about something outside of work, ca- cardiac comedy that you do that raises money for the British Heart Foundation for that annual event. Is that right? It is absolutely. Um, uh, talk to me a little bit about that. How did that come about? Getting involved in that. So. Very long story short, and I know that I'm on my best behaviour here and we won't still be talking about it in, be timing in six hours' time. Um, uh, I had uh, I had a birth defect, which resulted in me having open heart surgery um, just before I was two. Um, as a result of that, I always had annual heart checkups uh, and about, probably now, about 25 years ago, it was diagnosed that I had something called an aortic stenosis, which is a, a narrowing of my aorta. Um, in 2012, um, that had got to the stage where they wanted to operate again. So I've now got a titanium and carbon fiber aortic valve. Um, he ticks. You can't hear it, but he actually ticks. Yeah, like wow. a metronome. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. Wow. It's it's uh, it's quite something. Um, um, so that was that was the that was my the, the heart side of things. Mm. Um, back in 2000, I attended something called the Comedy School up in London because I've always had a massive passion for stand-up comedy. Um, took that up as a hobby, um, gigging around and that kind of stuff for the last for the last 23 years, and then in 2013 decided to put the two together and created Cardiac Comedy. So it was going to be an annual fundraiser for the British Heart Foundation. Um, this year's event is number 10, so it's a big oh. one. Um, all things being equal, we should go through the £30,000 raised this year, which is actually a massively significant figure because it's actually the cost of my valve, as my, my surgeon oh. divulged, that the valve they fitted in 2012 is, is, was £30,000 on its own without all of the, the skills of the surgeon and the um, intensive care team and all of that care. Um so we've been absolutely blessed with some of the acts that have given up their time. We've had um, Ramesh Ranganathan, we've had Angela Barnes, Zoe Lyons, Simon Evans. I could honestly go on and on and on and on and on. Um, 
it's it's hugely fun for me because I get to perform in front of 200 people, which you don't, as a, as a budding amateur stand-up, you don't get to perform in front of 200 people. Invariably, it's four people and a barman. Um, so, yeah, it's it's tremendous fun. It's a great night out. Um, it's at Comedia. It's in October. Um, please buy tickets. What's the date? Oh, October the 18th. Oh, mate. Love that. But good luck with your course. Yeah. <laughs> mate, give me some advice. <laughs> um, in, enjoy it. Be you is, is, uh, is the, the most important lesson that I was given um, was week one of my comedy course where the, the, the guy sort of running it said, we can't we can't make you funny. What you have to do is you have to you have to look at it. You look at it yourself. It's not about somebody giving you something mm-hmm. and saying, say this, it'll be funny. Um, and it's also that taking taking away the personal aspect of it in some respects, because when you're telling a story down the pub, everybody knows who always late Steve is yeah. and, and you can tell that joke but when the people don't know who always late steve is um it becomes a little bit more difficult but it's a brilliant journey to get yeah. and you'll you'll be absolutely i've known you a very long time you'll be absolutely <laughs> fine i think you'll really enjoy it where are you doing the course in in, in brighton we're doing um yeah, the Grand Central Pub. But um, I'm doing it with so one of the things this year, whole, the whole work life balance thing has come around about actually me and Kelly spending more time together trying to work out what that looks like, date nights or whatever, but trying to do something where we actually commit to something together. So we're actually doing it together, which oh, is going to be quite exciting. An eight week course together on the comedy. And she's definitely going to be better than me. She's got a brilliant, wicked sense of humour and she's very good with words. And I know she's going to be better, but I'm not telling her that. <laughs> she can't hear this. Yeah, I'm. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna go and it just it was just trying to do something that we do together. She's always wanted to do it stand up and stuff like that. So yeah. So are you, are you having an end of show or sort of an end we, of course? We, we, we are apparently. I'll let you know. So we need to watch this. Yeah. Watch this space for the tickets. Cardiac yeah. comedy. We can put the pair of you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't hold your breath on that. <laughs> but you, never, you, never, you never know. You never know. Ah, oh, it's mate. That's interesting. Amazing to what an amazing achievement as well to come out of something like that and then. And, and raise as much as you have, and, and yeah, create no, that it's, it's, it's incredible. It's, yeah, it's it's it, it is very it's a very very cool thing, yeah. but it's a lot it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I just it's yeah, the British Heart Fund is such a wonderful organisation. We 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 have partnered up with some other charities as well at various times yeah. because things have happened in things have happened in various um, um, our lives outside of everything. So we have contributed to some other charities as well. But yeah, the um, the heart charities is is certainly uh, certainly the key to that, and it and it also it touches so many people. Yeah. It's such a massive thing, um, and um, but I also know that everybody's going to come and have an amazing time at the gig as well. So it's very it's much much easier asking for people's money when you know you're going to deliver something Being that cool. they're going to enjoy as well. The strange thing is is we know eighty percent of the audience, probably eighty five percent of the audience, and actually it's the people that sort of come along and just randomly buy a ticket that I must think they must wonder what on earth they've walked into <laughs> yeah. because yeah it, it, it's a it's a party atmosphere it's yeah. a brilliant night we all tend to go out afterwards we all forget that it's on a Wednesday and the fact that we've all got to go to work the next day oh. and so everyone turns up with very very sore heads <laughs> so yeah no it's it's yeah I mean it's just a massive comment. Of we'll put you down for two tickets 100%, then. Um, yeah. We're in, 100%. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Well, look, we're coming towards the end. Before we go into sort of our quick fire questions, there's one thing. Obviously, I talk uh, the narrative around what success is to people, and it, it's different for everyone, and everyone has come on. But I'm keen to, just as you brilliantly shared your journey and your stories with me, where you sort of been where you are now, where you, where you sort of going. Talk to me. What, how do you define success? Oh. For me, success is paying the bills. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I think success is actually developing this company to the stage where it provides a legacy as well. So it's not just us, the legacy. Yes, hopefully it's something that, that either the kids go on to run or the fact that it will provide and set them up for the next stages as well. But it's also a legacy for the people that use us as well. So the fact that they're investing in their well-being actually helps to provide them with a way that actually they're not going to be suffering with aches and pains so they're delivering their best work which then goes on to push their companies forward as well so I I see it very much as one of the support elements for people and the fact that actually 
they've got to be comfortable they've got to be productive so that they can deliver their best work as well so for me success is actually making sure that every single person that sees us is more comfortable at their workstation brilliant what a brilliant answer I love that. And I'm interested, actually. I want to touch on something with you as well, then, Joe, with the whole like, the, that that level of success, or and when you come into expertise, I guess, and stuff like that. And you're seen, obviously, as an expert, you guys in the field, and then obviously getting on the BBC and that that, that sort of moment and stuff like. That. Is there ever like big buzzword that's been used a lot about the whole imposter syndrome thing all the time i feel it constantly i don't think you struggle quite as much with it no because i've got a massive ego yeah (laughs) (laughs) but i constantly it's like i'm talking at brighton seo this week about sort of mistakes people make from working from home and i'm like there thinking oh my god what happens if uh if they don't believe what i'm saying or something along those lines and I do think probably females struggle more than men with the imposter syndrome, but I constantly think I'm not clever enough, I don't know enough, I do a lot of research into this and I try and make sure that I'm always sort of up at the edge, but I'm like, oh God, should I should I have like a master's in it and should I have this in it? And so, yeah, I, I do constantly think actually I'm not sure I think that's got a little bit less I think we've just turned 50 this year and I think I am entering into that fuck it phase (laughs) (laughs) and it's like no I don't care quite as much now but I I do I I never think I'm good enough but I think that's partly what drives the business forward Mm. because I think the minute you think you're good enough is the minute you stop questioning that you stop learning Mm. and at that that's the point when actually you've got a problem so Amazing. It's, it's so interesting because you, look, just running a business for as long as you have, one, is a success, but two, proves that you know what you're doing and yeah. and not just by running a business, but actually within the field that you're in and being in that environment. So makes you an expert in what you what you are doing. And, and, yeah. that's, and that's incredible. And like you say, and then, but then to actually take those moments and look and go, oh, I was on the BBC, I'm doing that, I'm doing Brighton SEO. Okay? And, I, and you do deserve to be there and, and in, in every... Way, shape, yeah. and form. So we'll have to see if they invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Well, good luck with that. Well, that Thank you. Cool. Well, look, tell me what what does the future hold for posture people? Um. Well, that's an interesting one because having obviously, as we've discussed, discussed having been through having been through the last three <laughs> years, um, it, it, there's, there's doesn't matter how good you are at financial planning, there must be a who knows. <laughs> there must be a who knows answer. Um, growth. Uh, increasing the size of the team, um, helping more people, um, love your workspace, developing into being, I think, um, a much more recognised um, entity in terms of the office kind of fit out world. I think that would that yeah. would that would yeah. that would be the, want, the way that we'd like to shape that. We want people to sort of think, oh, who fits out your office? Love your workspace. I really love what they've done, and I want I want every member of staff to go. I'm comfortable at work. I really like this environment. Yeah. I think our vision for for the kind of growth of the business is the fact that we want to help more people. Fundamentally, we like helping people. And in some ways, we almost want to get it to the stage where our company doesn't exist anymore because everybody's set up properly. <laughs> I'm not sure that's ever going to happen, but that would really be where you the vision of the 2029 future... 2029 on. Yeah, yeah, 2029, we're, we're out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we stopped caring in yeah. 2029. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to be here to 2040. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Oh, awesome. Well, look, it's been brilliant talking to you both. Thank you so much for coming on and, and, and sharing your stories. I mean, great to, to what an amazing team you are together and as a, as a dynamic and what you obviously you've grown. So I'm always finished with my quick fire questions. So we've split these up. So you're going to go, we're going to go with you for one, Dave, and then over to you, Joe. So first one, if you could go back in time and change one specific moment in your life, what would that be and why? Um, possibly following the architectural thing and I actually I should have possibly gone and carried it on um, it's not a massive regret but I think if I was really going to shift something that would have changed something long term it would have been pursuing that really fair play fair play Joe tell me a specific story about someone in your life that's helped make you into the person you are today what did they do 
say there was a guy that I used to work with in Honda called Simon and he rang the marketing division at the time really switched on guy and he said to me he said you've got to have a plan make a plan of where you want to be in five years time because if you know that then you'll start working out all the steps to get there Mm. and it's almost like the two Simons actually so he was really good in helping us in sort of just kind of going okay I need to have a plan and then then it'll happen but then also Simon Conroy later in life I think he's been fundamental in helping us sort of structure and come up with some really good Mm. decisions for the business as well awesome and our parents. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Both our parents. Yeah. <laughs> Just in case they're listening, which yeah. they probably yeah. will be. <laughs> um, Dave, can you recommend a book or podcast to our listeners as an impact or influenced you? Well, Jo thought this question was hilarious when <laughs> she read it, uh, when she read the question, but purely because um, I don't really do books or podcasts. Um, and obviously, this is a, a business-related thing, so I'm going to give you the best book that there is out there on the market. It is a golf short game book called uh, Getting Up and Down by Tom Watson. <laughs> that book has completely changed my life, uh, <laughs> lowered my handicap down to where it is now. And Which I is would, what? Uh, eight, currently. Oh, impressive. Um, so I would, re- I would say that's the book that's had the most impact <laughs> on my life today, <laughs> completely unbusiness related sense. Well, we're planning a networking golf league together this year. We so are. So that is slightly business related yeah, because that is going to help me. I'm going to read that book <laughs> and that is going to help me get my handicap down, make me a better golfer, which will make me better on the networking yes, scene. So there we go. Very good. Though, very oh my good. God, Thank you very much. It's golf I've zoned down. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a golfer then? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> right, we're going to wrap up. Last one, Joe. One rule for living a fulfilled life. Avoid tequila. (laughs) (laughs) We talked about this earlier. And I was going to come up with something like be kind or or something like that. And Dave went, avoid tequila. Love that. I have never made a good decision when I've been drinking tequila. (laughs) (laughs) That is probably the best answer I've had to that question in in the 80 odd episodes I've done. So thank you for that. That brilliant. Listen, honestly, both of you, thank you so much. It's been great obviously chatting to you but obviously Dave I've known you for a long time great to get to know you Joe so thanks for coming on and sharing your story it's been it's been brilliant and wish you guys continued success with the, with the business thanks very much for having us yeah, thank you for really having us fun. awesome and that as they say is a wrap cheers awesome this is the County Business Talks podcast Produced by H2 Productions.